We are now into chapter 24, section 4. We're going to talk about carbenes. First of all, what is a carbene and what can we do with it? Well, it turns out we can take a, a, a reactive intermediate that we refer to as a carbene. And we can make cyclopropanes with that carbene. So here is an example. Um, here we've got... Uh, here we've got a carbon-carbon double bond, and then this is a carbene. We'll talk about the structure of the carbene here in a minute, but we get a reaction between that carbene. This is a, uh, a concerted reaction. We get a reaction between this carbene and the carbon-carbon double bond, and we form this, uh, we form this cyclopropane derivative, so the cyclopropane compound. So this carbon becomes this carbon. And then these R groups are the R groups that are attached there. There are some examples of compounds that can be made in doing this. Uh, so for example, this is a compound called pyrethrin. It's an insecticide um, that is commonly used. Here's another one, the deca, uh, decamethrin. And uh, again, it has, a, it has this cyclopropane component in it. This one looks uh, uh, pretty pretty exciting here we've got this ester that where the where the ester component where this is a cyanohydrin that looks nice and poisonous all right i have no idea on exactly the mechanism but uh, i wouldn't be surprised if the cyanohydrin had a component uh, of the uh, of the poison aspect of it so let's talk about carbenes we have not talked about carbenes before uh, carbenes, this is something that uh, is probably new to most of you if you're taking uh, if you're taking organic chemistry, undergraduate organic chemistry, this is probably new to you. So a carbene is a neutral reactive intermediate. It only has six valence electrons around it. There, it doesn't have a full octet. This is what the carbene looks like. You'll see that it is sp2 hybridized and that we have a lone pair of electrons in the sp2 orbital, and that we have no electrons, we have a vacant p orbital. All right, we'll find that, the, um, yeah, so that, that's this, so we have that uh, lone pair of electrons in our sp2 orbital, and we have no electrons in our p orbital. Now, I will, all right, so yeah, so that's where that is. There's two prominent features. Uh, one is that it's very reactive because it doesn't have a full octet. It really wants electrons. Since it really wants electrons, it's electron deficient. It acts as an electrophile. All right, now I'm going to mention this just in case there's somebody out there. There are two kinds of carbenes in the carbene universe. Uh, with this kind, which is called a singlet carbene, and it has uh, paired electrons. Both of those electrons are in the sp2 orbital. There's another kind of carbene that we are not talking about here that is called a triplet carbene. It is a different beast. It does different things. Uh, you may run into it later, uh, but just so you know, there are two types of carbenes. We're talking about this one that is called a singlet carbene. And if you're wondering, where do we get the name singlet and triplet? It has to do with uh, the ESR spectrum. And if, if you're not familiar with that, don't worry, just, just go on. All right, so now let's talk about uh, examples of this that we can actually do. So one is called uh, um, a dihalocarbene, and it is going to have a halogen. That halogen can be, uh, it can be chlorine, it can be bromine. Um, I think it can even be iodine, but we're going to look at chlorine and bromine for sure. So if we have a dihalocarbene, so here we have, uh, this is got two halogens. Again, it could be chlorine, which is the example down here. They are very reactive intermediates, but, um, and then, and they're also fairly easy to make. To make them, you simply treat chloroform with potassium terbutoxide. Now this may be something that's surprising to you, but chloroform has a pKa of about 15 and a half. So it's possible to deprotonate that hydrogen from chloroform. And when you do, you're going to get an intermediate and that intermediate is gonna decompose and give you the dichlorocarbene. You do need something that's strong enough as a base and the strong enough base that we use is my favorite sterically hindered strong base, potassium terbutoxide. So 
There we go. That's my favorite steric. I think I've said that before. You will get uh, the conjugate acid of the uh, of the potassium terbutoxide and KCl, and then here you'll have your dichlorocarbene. So that dichlorocarbene can then react with your alkene. Let's look at the mechanism for formation of our dichlorocarbene. So it's a two-step process. The very first step of that process is that we deprotonate the chloroform. As I mentioned, chloroform has a pKa of around 15 and a half. So it's relatively easy to deprotonate with the, uh, with the potassium terbutoxide. That also means that it's possible to deprotonate this with like hydroxide, which is if you're using chloroform, you probably don't want to use it in the presence of a strong base because that it could decompose and form this uh, carbene, which is a very reactive compound, a very reactive intermediate. I just say this uh, out of caution. So if you're using chloroform in the lab as a solvent, be careful when using it with a strong base. All right, loss of chloride. So um, this uh, anion, this carbanion is going to lose a chloride. So that's the conjugate base of chloroform. It will lose the chloride. It'll form the dichlorocarpene, and you'll also get chloride. Pretty cool. So now let's look at the reaction mechanism where dichlorocarbene reacts with an alkene. So here we can do cyclopropanation, which that's a fun word to say, cyclopropanation by using our dichlorocarbene in the presence of our alkene We'll form the cyclopropane, and we'll have two chloro groups on there. Now, we're not doomed to keep those two chloro groups on there forever, although you might want to, who knows, uh, but we're not doomed to keep them on there forever. Uh, the carbene uh, does addition in a syn fashion, and it does it in a concerted fashion. So once that carbene approaches your alkene, we're going to form a new carbon-carbon bond here, a new carbon-carbon bond there uh, to give us the cyclopropane ring, and it happens all in one step. As a consequence, any stereochemistry that you had here is going to be retained when you are uh, when you get your product. So, if your alkene has a particular stereochemistry, your cyclopropane is also going to have that stereochemistry. And so that I show here. Uh, that it is stereospecific. So if we take but2ene, there's two there's two diastereomers of but2ene. There is the cis but2ene, and if you start with the cis but2ene and treat it with your dichlorocarbene, uh, you will get the cis cyclopropane ring. Um, this has a plane of symmetry with the two uh, things. So this is a meso compound, meaning that these two are identical. So that's something to remember there, that these are identical. And if we do the trans but2ene and treat it with our carbene, all right, we will get, uh, we'll have two stereogenic centers that are the same. So these two stereogenic centers are the same, uh, which means that that is, um, that's an optically active compound. That is a particular enantiomer. This is the enantiomer of that. And so these are mirror images of each other, which they don't look at it, look like it here, but trust me, they are mirror images. Okay, so let's look at the whole synthesis and let's look at something else that we can do with those two chloro groups. So once we form that dicyclo, uh, the dihalo cyclopropane, we can convert the halogen groups into alkyl groups using organocuprates. So if we take cyclohexene and react it with, this one is uh, bromoform, and so we're going to form the dibromo version of this. We'll deprotonate that, we'll form the dibromocarbene, we'll re, uh, that will react with our alkene to give us this cyclopropane, and then we can react that with this, uh, um, with this organocuprate and these methyl groups will replace the bromine and we will get that. So cyclopropanation with our dibromocarbene and then reaction with the lithium dimethyl cuprate, so our organic cuprate, and we'll get that. Let's look at 
number 11. Uh, we're going to look at number 10 and 11 because uh, because uh, I, I, I seem to have, well, we're going to look at 10 and 11. I don't know if I skipped something or whatever, but uh, for number 10, so here for number 10, uh, we are going to draw all the stereoisomers that are formed when these alkenes react with chloroform and the, uh, the potassium terbutoxide. So this and this are going to make our carbene, which means that we are going to get dichloro and we'll have a methyl there. I'm going to indicate that with a wedge to indicate that that's one particular enantiomer. However, because we started off with something achiral, we're either going to get an achiral product or a racemic mixture. And in this case, we're going to get the racemic mixture. So I'm going to put plus the enantiomer. All right. When we do that with this particular one, I'm going to draw this as that. We'll put the two chloro groups here. And then, uh, and so these two carbons are those two carbons there. So we'll have an ethyl that is here and an ethyl that is a wedge that is here. And as you see, there is a plane of symmetry that goes right down the middle, even though we have two stereogenic centers. So that means this is a meso compound. All right, on this one, All right, so we'll get our cyclopropane, and I'm drawing wedges there. It's a little bit challenging uh, uh, to draw these. There's our methyl group that is there, and so if we come in from the top side, we'll get this, and since it's chloro, we'll have two chloro groups here. This has two stereogenic centers, and they are not mirror image, so this is not a meso compound, so we are going to get an enantiomer for this. So we will get the enantiomer of that as well. All right, so let's look at this. How do we synthesize this? So how do we synthesize this? So for this, um, uh, we're going to start with 2-methylpropene or isobutylene. Pull this down a little bit and draw isobutylene. All right, so that's isobutylene. It's achiral. In fact, all of these are achiral, so I'm not going to draw wedges and dashes. I'm just going to draw. Um, I am just going to draw the compounds with the substituents because none of these are going to be stereogenic centers. So, first, we'll start with the isobutylene, and we're going to react that with chloroform. So CHCl3 and potassium terbutoxide, so OCCH3-3. Again, my, fa my favorite strong, sterically hindered base. I mean, doesn't everybody have a strong, favorite strong, sterically hindered base? All right, so these two carbons are going to be these two. The two methyls are going to be here. And then our two chloros are going to be there, and the carbon that was in the chloroform is this carbon. So that is the product of this reaction. In a similar fashion, we can make the bromo version of this. So it's pretty much the same reaction, except we're going to use bromoform, so BR3, so CHBR3, the potassium terbutoxide, Everybody's favorite. I say everybody's. It's not everybody's favorite. I've been told that other people don't have favorite strong sterically hindered bases. I don't really know why you would do that, but why wouldn't you have one, right? All right, so here, this is the product of this particular reaction. And then when you're looking at this, you may think, well, how are we going to do that? Like, how are we going to do that? And the way that we're going to do that is that we're going to take this as our starting material since we've made it already. We're going to take that as our starting material. 
and then we're going to use uh, we're going to use our organocuprate so CH3 2 CuLi and I think we need two equivalents of that and we will end up getting we'll end up replacing those bromos with methyls so we'll get this tetramethyl uh, uh, tetramethyl cyclopropane. So it would be 1122 tetramethyl cyclopropane. It just flows off the tongue. All right. So now we're going to look at a cool reaction called the Simmons Smith reaction. And I need, I need to give you a little bit of background of why we have something that's called the Simmons Smith reaction. First of all, there were two people, Simmons and Smith. Uh, but other than that, the reason that we have a Simmons-Smith reaction is because uh, chemists don't always want the dichloro or dibromo cyclopropane. Sometimes they may just want, uh, instead of the dichlorocarbene, they may want to use like just uh, the methylene carbene. So the dichloro and the dibromo, those are pretty easy to use. Uh, and you get good yields to get your halogenated cyclopropane. But if you try to use methylene as a carbene, so CH2 that has the, the carbene, very reactive. It's the simplest carbene. The problem is that you make that by heating up diazomethane. And so here's diazomethane. It is a, it's a compound that you can make with, uh, um, well, you can make it, you can make this diazomethane. It is... You, you can make this and store it, although I wouldn't store it very long. When you heat it up, it will decompose. It will give you a methylene carbene and uh, this nitro. This is also a photosensitive reaction. Uh, there's a whole story behind that. But All right, so this reaction, uh, if you attempt to do this, this reaction cannot be done reliably for cyclopropane synthesis. And in fact, when you do this, um, there's all kinds of rearrangements that occur. And in fact, one of one of the compounds, actually several, a whole class of compounds that I was synthesizing during graduate school is where I made these diazo compounds and then I purposely would shine light on them, so do photochemistry on them. It would break the carbon-nitrogen bond, it would form a carbene, and then that carbene would rearrange with an adjacent carbonyl to give a compound that's called a ketene. That ketene would react with other stuff. And, and anyway, it's a long story. Uh, um, maybe you didn't want to hear that story. I don't know, but I told it anyway. All right, so there we go. Methylene in this, but this methylene reacts with all kinds of stuff uh, uh, and it gives you all kinds of rearrangements and stuff that you wouldn't necessarily want. So what's a way around that? I'll show you a way around that. And the way around that is called the Simmons-Smith reagent or the Simmons-Smith reaction. We use a Simmons-Smith reagent. So we can get a non-halogenated cyclopropane by taking diiodomethane and putting it in the presence of a copper-activated zinc reagent that is called a zinc-copper couple. So zinc and copper together. So it's called a zinc-copper couple. And when we do this, it's called the Simmons-Smith reaction. So we'll put the, uh, the diiodomethane, our zinc-copper couple, and our alkene all together. And look at that. We get uh, the formation of the cyclopropane, but we don't have any halogens on it. So we've skipped those halogens. We've gotten rid of them. Here is a more specific example where we have, instead of R groups, we have actual groups here, cyclohexene. We treat it with this diiodomethane in the presence of our zinc copper couple. And look, we form this cyclopropane derivative. We also get zinc iodide, in case you're wondering where the iodide goes. Uh, that's the reaction. Let's look at the mechanism. The mechanism's kind of cool because we don't actually form a carbene in the process of doing this. We sort of uh, forego the whole carbene thing. So it doesn't have a free carbene. It has sort of a latent carbene that we use up right away. Uh, so here's how it works. We um, 
the diiodomethane reacts with our zinc copper couple, which I think, wow, what a cute couple zinc and copper would be. Anyway, so we have our zinc copper couple and it forms a reactive intermediate, our reactive ingredient that we call iodomethyl zinc iodide. So iodomethyl zinc iodide, there's a bond between iodine and carbon and then obviously it has the two hydrogens on it. There's a bond between the carbon and the zinc and the zinc and the iodine. And we call this the Simmons-Smith reagent. And as I mentioned, that is the iodomethyl zinc iodide. So that's this guy. When we put that in there, it, or when we put the iodomethane in with the zinc copper couple, it will form this reagent. That reagent will then react with your alkene as if this were a carbene, but it never forms that methylene carbene at any time. It just goes straight from this to this. And so it transfers the CH2 to an alkene to make our cyclopropane. Pretty cool reaction. I have not done this reaction in person, so uh, if you have, feel free to send me a comment. A cool thing about the Simmons-Smith reaction, uh, and this has in common with the the carbene reaction that we were talking about earlier, is that it is stereospecific. So if you have a cis alkene, you're going to get the cis cyclopropane. If you have the trans alkene, you'll get the trans cyclopropane. All right, so this is uh, where we take cis hex three ene, so in the three hexene that's in the cis configuration, and we treat it with our uh, diiodomethane and our zinc copper couple. What a cute couple! And uh, and then we get our cis one two diethyl cyclopropane, and that cis one two diethyl cyclopropane that's a meso compound. Uh, um, so we don't have an enantiomer of that. And now we're going to look at the same thing, but we're going to do the trans version. So let's look at the trans version. So we're going to go over here. Let's do the trans. So one, two, three, four, five, six, trans. So this is trans hex three ene, which is this. And we're going to treat this with our CH2I2 zinc copper couple. And uh, when we do that, it will form our Simmons Smith reagent that happens all in situ. And we're going to get a cyclopropane. So let's draw the cyclopropane here. We'll have one where we've got an ethyl group that is a wedge, comes out, and we'll have uh, an ethyl group that is a dash line that's going back. All right, this has two stereogenic centers that are the same, so that's one enantiomer. Since we started off with something achiral, we have to have a racemic mixture. I'm gonna go ahead and draw that other one, so. This is not the most beautiful cyclopropane with uh, uh, stereogenic centers I've ever drawn, but there you go. These are enantiomers of each other. They're mirror images. We would get a 50-50 mixture of these. All right, we're on to our final topic, which is talking about olefin metathesis. And I like olefin metathesis for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's very cool. Uh, but two, it is a very useful way to make carbon-carbon double bonds. So here we've got alkene metathesis, uh, um, which is sometimes called olefin metathesis. Olefin is just another word for alkenes. It's a, a, an industry word that we use for alkenes. And so we can get reactions between uh, two alkene molecules that, it, it, that results in the metathesis or the interchange of the carbon-carbon double bonds. So here we've got two identical alkene molecules. And when we do this, we will get a new bond between this carbon and this carbon to form this alkene. We will get a mixture of E and Z isomers, so we get a diastereometric, a diastereometric mixture. 
And then we get it also a new bond between this carbon and this carbon to form ethylene. So we're going to break two complete carbon-carbon double bonds and make two new complete carbon-carbon double bonds. And so again, we call it metathesis because it's essentially an exchange. That's that's all metathesis means is that it's an exchange. So we make a new carbon-carbon bond between these and a new carbon-carbon double bond between these and we get these two products. Now, there are some limitations to this. Um, if you attempt to do this with just some random alkene, you're probably going to run into some issues. But if you if you pick your alkene carefully, you will get uh, uh, you will get uh, some good choices. Now, there are a num there are several. I won't say a number. There are several, although several would be a number. Uh, there are several catalysts that we can use to do this, uh, and usually it is a transition metal catalyst, and it's usually a fairly complex catalyst. I'm going to show you an example that's called the Grubbs catalyst. It uses ruthenium, and you'll see that we have this uh, we have this uh, phenyl group with an with a carbon that has a double bond going to ruthenium. And so the one with ruthenium is called a Grubbs catalyst. There are other variations of the Grubbs catalyst. So some people have come along and modified the Grubbs catalyst to make it do specific things. And so there are other modifications. And there are other chemists who have developed sort of independently tungsten catalyst and molybdenum catalyst, which have, uh, which have their place. And those tung and the tungsten and molybdenum uh, catalyst usually those are called Schrock catalysts, named after uh, Professor Schrock, who was at uh, MIT, I think. All right. Anyway, um, so if, if Richard Schrock is his name. I had to think about that for a second. Uh, this one, Grubbs, is named after Robert Grubbs. I was I was very sad to hear oh, in uh, December of 2021, I don't know when you're going to be listening to this, in December of 2021, uh, Robert Grubbs passed away um, and uh, kind of suddenly, and he was 79, but uh, he is a chemist who I have met and he was a really great guy. Um, in addition to being a brilliant chemist, he was a really great guy. So I was very sad to hear of his passing. So if we uh, take this uh, Grubbs catalyst, we can use it to, uh, and we use ruthenium as our, as our uh, catalyst metal. Um, in case you're wondering, none of these are particularly cheap, uh, particularly the ruthenium ones are not very cheap, but uh, since they're catalytic, we can use small amounts. All right, so uh, metathesis are usually compatible with many functional groups like OHs, OR, uh, um, carbonyl groups. So we don't have to have just a plain molecule we can use in the presence of some of these other functional groups. All right. So the usefulness for these metathesis reactions, if you just take a random mixture, if you take two alkenes and you put them together, uh, if you take the two alkenes, then there are four or not four, there are several possible products that you could get. And so um, sometimes you'll get two, sometimes you'll get three, sometimes you'll get more, depending on what you have. If you throw two different alkenes in there, yeah, it's, it's likely to, uh, to give you a really complex thing. However, if you use a terminal alkene like this, and you just use one terminal alkene, you can make a new bond between this carbon and another carbon that's identical. So you can like cut this in half and make a dimer of this, essentially. And then the other alkene that you're going to get is ethylene. Ethylene is very low molecular weight, so it's a gas. That gas will escape out of your reaction, and that drives your equilibrium to the right. So it's a very fancy use of Le Chatelier's principle by producing a product that is a gas. So here, these are a couple of examples of doing this reaction. You do get a mixture of stereoisomers, so you do get both the, the E and Z diastereomers. All right. But let's think about how do we draw these products. How can we do this and draw these products? So to draw the products of a uh, using the Grubbs olefin metathesis, so you can put them right next to each other, but if it's the same thing, you can kind of just think about it and draw it. Um, we're going to break that carbon-carbon double bond, and we're going to make a new bond between this carbon and this carbon, and a new double bond between this carbon and this carbon. 
will get ethylene plus, plus our product. All right. Now, again, we would never do this just to make ethylene. Ethylene is not the point. Ethylene is, is very cheap to buy, so you wouldn't ever make ethylene by this product. The whole point is to make this particular product. If you happen to get it where it didn't match up, like you got um, you got this one going with this one, you're just going to get your starting material over again. But that's good because that starting material can just react again until you get this. And so, uh, again, this is the advantage of using Le Chatelier's principle and driving the reaction to the right by removing this gaseous product. So let's look at number 14 and look at what product is formed uh, when we use olefin metathesis on these particular uh, alkenes. So we'll come over here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to break that carbon-carbon double bond, and we're going to get a new bond that uh, we're going to get a new bond between this carbon five and uh, another one that is identical to it. So when we do that, we use again our Grubbs catalyst. I'm not going to write out the whole reagent. We'll draw this part. So one, two, three, four, five. All right, and so that's that component. We'll have a double bond. And we'll have one, two, three, four, five, and a methyl there. So this is the E isomer. You're also going to get the Z isomer. So you will get a mixture of diastereomers. Now, I'll also mention that the other product you're going to get is going to be ethylene. Not an equal sign, it's ethylene. So CH2, CH2. So you get both of those things when you do this reaction. Let's do the same thing with this. We're going to break this bond. We'll make a new bond between this carbon and another carbon that is identical. And we'll also get ethylene. So I'll come over here and I'll put the ethylene. Get that one out of the way. And we're just going to draw this. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And then here we've got a methoxy group. All right, so I've drawn those two components. We'll have a double bond here. And again, I am drawing the I'm drawing the E isomer. You would get the Z isomer as well. So just be prepared. You're going to get a mixture of cis and trans. All right, and we'll get an OCH3 there. And I'll go ahead and mention it. Plus the Z isomer. All right, this one is really simple. There's no isomers for one thing, right? You don't get any uh, uh, E and Z with this one. So we're going to break that. We're going to get two of these cyclopentanes that are connected by a double bond. And ethylene. All right, and so that is that particular product. All right, we're getting close to being done here with this chapter. Okay. So now let's talk about the olefin metathesis mechanism. I show this not because, for my students, not because I expect you to reproduce this on your next exam. Now, instead, I show it to you because, one, it gets you familiar with uh, this particular type of mechanism, and two, um, there might be students who are watching this who are, from, uh, who are taking a more advanced course. In that case, you may need to know the mechanism. I'm probably not going to give you enough help to do that mechanism here, but we're going to start with our, uh, our catalyst. In this case, it's a Grubbs catalyst uh, that will react with it will react with our starting material, and that's going to give us, it's going to give us this intermediate. So we'll have ruthenium, uh, uh, the CH2 that's from here, this CH2 from here, and then this carbon is from there, and then that is going to eliminate one of our products, that product being ethylene. That ethylene, because it's a gas, is going to bubble right out. So then we have this. This is reactive and will react with another molecule of our starting material. And when it does, we are going to get 
uh, we're going to get this. Now, sometimes this will uh, go the other way where this R will be here and this will be here. But if that happens, then we're just back to this. But here, if we get this, then we're going to form that double bond between these two carbons and we will get our product. It will be both E and Z, as I mentioned. Uh, and then you will be back to this as your starting material. Well, that can happen hundreds, thousands of times. So it is a catalytic amount of ruthenium or the ruthenium catalyst or Grubbs catalyst. Um, and that's a good thing because ruthenium catalysts are not very cheap. Okay, so I just looked it up because I was curious how much is our Grubbs catalyst. Uh, I just looked it up on uh, Sigma Aldrich. If you order it from them, you can get as of, as of, uh, um, let's see, April 2022, you can get it for 100 milligrams for $42. Uh, you can get 2 grams for $534 or 10 grams for $2,500. If you're feeling, uh, if you're feeling rich, twenty-five hundred dollars for ten grams. Ten grams, by the way, is less than half an ounce. So, this is not cheap, not cheap stuff. But if you really need that product, totally worth it. So let's look at our ring closing metathesis. This is just a variation of the same reaction that we were just talking about. However, what's different? is that we get a ring when we uh, when we close this. So here, uh, we've got this particular compound. It's got eight carbons in it. And we're going to lose these two on the end to form ethylene. And then these two, uh, these two are going to combine to make uh, um, a ring. So we're going to get an intramolecular um, olefin metathesis. So it's an intramolecular olefin metathesis. Now, typically, when you do these intramolecular olefin metathesis, you do them in a very dilute solution. Here's why. If you have this uh, combined with your catalyst, your Grubbs catalyst, if you have that at higher concentration, you're more likely to have this molecule run into your catalyst while it already has some of this reagent on it. In that case, you may get like oligomers, which are just multiples of this. So you may get the multiples of these six carbons added in a chain rather than getting the ring closing. So if you do it very dilute, you can avoid that and you'll do the intramolecular far more likely than you'll get the intermolecular. So this is one of those cases where we, we tend to do these in very dilute solutions. All right. For um, here is a ring closing metathesis example. So here we've got two uh, uh, two alkenes on the same group. We throw in our Grubbs catalyst, and we will get uh, a double bond. So one, two, three, four, five atoms in that in uh, in that chain. There's the two on the end. They're going to become the ethylene, but then these two combine together to give us this five membered ring. Similar thing here. One, two, three, four, five. So those five will be in the ring. These two on the end are going to end up being our ethylene over there. All right. If you want to think about this retrosynthetically, um, then you can do the same thing. You can find it, find where the carbon-carbon double bond that you formed was, add, uh, um, add an ethylene onto each of those, and then that will tell you what it is. We're going to do an example of that here in a minute. This is an example for... Uh, um, for the uh, um, synthesis of an anti-cancer drug. I'm not familiar with this drug at all, but, um, you know, it's an anti-cancer drug. You use the olefin metathesis here to combine these two carbons. These two carbons become ethylene. It's not shown here, but they become ethylene. They bubble out. You'll get that new carbon-carbon double bond, and then uh, you would do epoxidation of that carbon-carbon double bond to get, uh, to get this epoxide. So pretty cool. We're going to look at numbers 16 and 36. So 16 and 36. And after we do that, that will be the end of this chapter. All right. So first thing, when you're doing this kind of problem, I recommend finding where we're going to break the new bonds and do the olefin metathesis. So we're going to cut that carbon-carbon double bond, that carbon-carbon double bond, and then those two components are going to become ethylene. So we'll end up with ethylene over here. 
So that's the easy part. And then uh, I recommend kind of counting out. So we'll do one, two, three, four, five, and six. So when we count out those, not including the, F, the methylenes on the end, uh, when we count those out, we have six. That means we're going to have a six-membered ring. I recommend drawing a six-membered ring. So draw a six-membered ring. All right. I'm going to make this the new bond that was formed, which means that this was carbons one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then once you figured out which carbons here map to over here, then just put the rest of the of the functional group on there. So on carbon four, we had a, a bond there, there. We had a methyl there. O. Here, I'm going to drop pH there. I kind of didn't put enough room in there. All right, so we've got that. And then we, we need to figure out this. We've got a stereochemistry here. So I'm going to put a wedge there to indicate this wedge. Carbon 2 is a carbonyl. So here we've created this alpha, beta, unsaturated carbonyl compound in doing this. And then you can just make sure that you've got all your carbons. So we've got all six of those, the carbonyl there. And then we got the two carbons over here that formed ethylene. And so that is that. All right, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to cut these two. All right, so on the end, we're going to have ethylene. So I'll put that ethylene there. All right, now let's count these out. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So we're going to make a carbon-carbon, or we're going to make a six-membered ring that has a carbon-carbon double bond, so a cyclohexane cyclohexene rather, so we'll draw our six-membered ring. I'll go ahead and put the carbon-carbon double bond there. You can put it on the other side, doesn't really matter. And to help match this up, I'm gonna count these out. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then these carbons on the end became the ethylene. And now we need to put the substituents on here. So in carbon three, we've got this carbonyl OCH3. So, and draw that. So, carbonyl, O, CH3. And on carbon four, we have the same thing a carbonyl, O, CH3. All right, and so those are our two products there. All right, on number 36, we're looking at doing a retrosynthesis. So we're kind of going backwards here. We'll be doing a, a retrosynthesis arrow. And we want to figure out what was the starting diene that we used to make this. Again, I recommend identifying the carbon-carbon bond that you just formed. We're going to add uh, an, a methylene to the end of each of those. And we're going to call this carbon 1, 2, 3, four, five, uh, we'll go ahead and count this oxygen as number six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 for this carbon. And that's just to help us identify, map it out so we know which carbons are which. So I'm gonna do an, um, a carbon-carbon double bond at the end where this carbon is the carbon that's attached to that uh, carbon number one, and then there's carbon one. We'll have carbon two, three, four, five. Carbon five has a carbonyl. Carbon six is not a carbon, it's an oxygen. So atom six is oxygen. Seven, eight, nine, ten, and then ten has a double bond on it. So let's count those out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And then the, uh, the little methylene is on the end. And then that, that's going to be lost as, uh, that's going to be lost as ethylene when we do the metathesis reaction. All right, we're going to do the same thing here. So we'll do retrosynthesis. Again, identify the carbon-carbon double bond. That's pretty easy when there's only one. And then we'll just call this one, 
two, three, four, five, and six. So once we have identified what the six atoms are that are in the ring, so five carbons and that oxygen, then we can come over here and we'll start by drawing a carbon-carbon double bond. And the first bond is the ethylene, or the methylene that's gonna be lost as ethylene. And then this is carbon one. All right, and then carbon two is a carbonyl. Carbon three isn't a carbon, it's an oxygen. So that's atom three. And then four, five, six, and then a double bond. So again, just a label two, three, three is the oxygen, four, five, six, and then we have a methylene on, uh, on the end here, and that's gonna be lost as ethylene when we do the metathesis. We still have a substituent that we need to place on carbon four, it's just an ethyl group. All right, and we get that as our ethyl group. All right. So here we've got another one. Um, let's identify the carbon-carbon double bond that we formed in the course of this reaction, which is that one. And then it doesn't matter which way we number this. I'm going to number it this way. So one, two, three, four, five. And so one, two, three, four, and five. And let's go ahead and draw the, the cyclohexane because the cyclohexane is gonna be there to begin with. So we'll have that cyclohexane there to begin with. And we're gonna call this carbon one and two. Those are those two carbons. On carbon one, we do have a carbon-carbon double bond here. So we have a little methylene group that comes off. So we'll draw carbon three, four, five, I got a little crazy there. All right, I'm just gonna, I know this is kind of picky here, but. All right, so there's, so there's three, four, five, and then we have an extra uh, uh, carbon on the end. So this is three, four, five, and then, we'll, and then as I said, this and this will give us ethylene uh, on carbon three, we have the CO2CH3. We'll have a CO2CH3. And so that is just a, a little um, ester group that is on there. So we'll have our cyclohexane ring uh, and then kind of work your way back. And again, labeling this is totally going to help when it comes to doing these retrosynthesis. So if we go back here, that is the end of chapter 24. So we are done with our uh, our sort of other ways to make carbon-carbon bonds that we haven't seen in other uh, we haven't seen in other chapters. So I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, stay tuned. I might do chapter 25. We'll see.